Good afternoon and welcome to the UK Genesis podcast with me, Ben Furphy. Hi, I'm Gary Jones. And this week we're joined by Welsh design extraordinaire, Thomas Jones. Uh, so uh, obviously most people, a lot of people will be aware of, of Thomas uh, in the, uh, the Genesis community uh, and be aware that he is quite well involved in both the design and the development side of uh, Genesis Framework, at least using it. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Thomas? Uh, well, I'm a freelance WordPress and Genesis designer based in the UK. Um, I work mainly with uh, other freelancers, um, small businesses and uh, agencies across the world, um, designing, developing and helping to maintain um, their websites and their client websites as well. Okay. Um, so you said that you you tend to work with other agencies and uh, developers. I mean, <clears throat> how much end client work do you do? Uh, most of the work that I've done in the past has come either in the form of um, being outsourced from a, fr a friend of mine who owns a, a search engine optimization agency in Dubai. Um, Otherwise, the work comes in mainly from fellow freelancers um, outsourcing typically the development side of things to me. They'll probably hand me a, a PSD file or a, a Fireworks image file and tell me, go ahead and build that. Okay. Um, how did you get involved in, in web development and web design in, originally? Uh, I think it started when I was in, in school. It was about year throughout year 9 or 10 and we were doing, um, we were asked to build a website and I started building it using a Microsoft front page. Um, from there on I started playing about a bit more, um, installed WordPress. That, that didn't deter you? What? Using front page didn't deter you? Uh, no, cause at, at the time I, I had no idea what I was doing so <laughs> <laughs> I moved on from there then I started using Dreamweaver to build um, static websites um, and then and I found WordPress and I started building uh, WordPress powered sites then. Um, and yeah, from then I took a break when I was in university. And when I came back, I started to, after finishing my courses in uni, started uh, working again with WordPress. Um, and yeah, it's just kind of stuck from there then. Okay, okay. Uh, just a quick note, anybody who wants to ask Thomas a question, simply tag your uh, question on Twitter with the hashtag hashtag UK Genesis and we will put the questions to Thomas. Um, so you were saying that you started off building static websites. Um, was it a personal decision to move towards using WordPress or were you working sort of and doing a little bit of freelance at the time and that sort of pushed you? I think uh, I started off with static websites and um, after that, I remember when I really got into things. We had the um, like the tutorial website boom. I think it was something like, it was Pixel to Life. I started introducing a bit of WordPress um, tutorials on that, and it's just something I, I sort of fell into then. And instead of just starting up with a, a blank index file, I just installed WordPress locally and start building from there. Then, and um, yeah, it, it made it's a no-brainer then just to keep on working with a platform that I enjoy using. Okay, and I guess the, the next question naturally is when did you start working with Genesis and how did you come across it? Um, I've been aware of Genesis for a while. Um, I think one of the earliest interactions I had with it was actually a comment that Gary left on my blog about four or five years ago. I was, um, it was during the time when thesis was starting to get um, being talked about and I, I wrote a post defending the framework, so to speak, and then Gary pretty much wrote a blog post in my comment section telling me how good Genesis was and maybe I should take a look at it. Um, I think the final nail in the coffin then was um, Thesis 2.0 came out and I just went, I'm not touching this. And I, I jumped over to Genesis, installed it. Took a little bit of time to get used to how things worked, but from there on then, I just stuck with this framework. It's a good point because <clears throat> quite a few people know that you were quite a, a hardcore advocate of thesis, um, you could say. When you moved over to Genesis, did you um, find that people followed you over in terms of customers that you've been working with, or did you end up finding that you had to find a whole new range of customers? Um, 
most of the people I worked with, I, bu I built the projects to start with on thesis, and then if they came back with more work for me then, um, once I'd uh, changed my development practice to suit using, or to build websites with Genesis, I'd just suggest to them, I'd rather, I built with Genesis now, do you mind if we use this framework on this project? And like 99% of the time, they turn around and say, yeah, that's fine. And I found that making the switch from thesis to Genesis, especially with client work, didn't take that much convincing to do at all. Can you remember what you, you wrote on Thomas's uh, blog, Gary? Not at all. He, uh, he probably find it because I think he sent it to me a little while ago. But uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, he did. But there's kind of like uh, twenty paragraphs of stuff. <laughs> well, that would fill the rest of the show. I suppose so yeah, so I'm, I'm not going to go through it. But yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> I was obviously quite passionate about Genesis at that point as well. So. Uh, um, <laughs> so I mean, in terms of, it, obviously. You moved from one framework to another. Did you consider at any point not using a framework? Did you consider, or was it just, you know, I, I'm going to use a framework, you know, it's either a case of which one, and it turned out to be Genesis? Um, well, I started with the thesis there, and I started looking elsewhere. Um, I had a look at things like the underscores, um, the uh, underscores uh, framework, uh, some of the Woo theme stuff, and um, I was pretty sad that I wanted to use a framework, mainly coming coming over from thesis and the fact that I knew uh, there was a solid base for me to start working off. Um, I didn't have to spend time doing X, Y, and Z on each project. That The framework covered that for me. Um, so it was, it was a no-brainer jumping from one framework to another. Okay. And obviously, um, in terms of development isn't the only thing that you do. You also are quite an adept designer as well. Um, you designed the, the UK Genesis uh, website. You actually coded it, for example. Um, what what do you prefer doing? Do you prefer designing, developing, uh, a mix of the two? Um, a mix of the two. I'd like to take on more projects in the future where maybe it's more design, just just to experience that. But I'm equally at home jumping into Sketch and building a website layout as I am jumping into Sublime or Atom and building the thing from scratch. Do you find that you <clears throat> prefer to split your projects if you're working on the design? So if you work on the design, you outsource the development to someone else, or are you happy to to work on both? Um, I'm happy at the moment to work on both, and I, I haven't come across a situation of a project that, that's warranted me, warranted me uh, outsourcing any of the steps yet, but I'm equally happy to put my hands up on a project and say, I can't do this, I'm happy to outsource it. Hmm. Okay. And do you outsource to UK people or do you find that you have to outsource to people outside of outside of the UK to find the right skill set? Um, I think it's about building a relationship with fellow designers and developers. Um, I've got no problem if, if it came to it, outsourcing work, work to someone in America if I knew them beforehand, or if it was someone in the UK, um, if I'm happy that there's a good relationship between the two of us, I'm happy to um, outsource to whoever. Okay. And obviously you've been involved with the UK Genesis website from the almost the beginning. Um, wh where do you see that going? Um, I think I've seen it develop from from ideas in an IRC chat a year or so ago to where it is now. I think it's going to be down the line a good a good resource for people looking for UK developers with the Genesis framework, um, especially if we do what we want to and possibly add a directory at some point in the future to make it easier for people to find, say, a, a developer in the UK or a designer in the UK. Do you find that you think that there's a <clears throat> it's there's a shortage of uh, Genesis developers in the UK that it's it's difficult to find the ones that are out there at the moment or do you think that it's you know it's it's really not that difficult but the the directory will essentially just bring them all together in one place? I think the directory will definitely help. Um, I think that is something that we I think possibly the, the two you Ben and possibly Gary noted especially in the WordCamp Birmingham. Um, the slight mention of the Genesis framework was greeted with a, a not, not so 
positive response as the other things were. But now maybe the directory and what people, what we're doing with the UK Genesis website, will help change people's minds about it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I guess one of the the, the big things that I, in particular I've noticed, and, and that you know, it's it's happening. Personally, to me, it's how I'm seeing a lot of it in the um, the Genesis Slack group. Is that people are increasingly moving towards tools like ACF, CMB2, to try and make their websites easier to use for end clients. What's your position on that? Um, if anything makes updating content for the clients down the line easier, I'm all for it. Um, simply. Okay. Um, and got a relevant question from Davinda. What What's your favorite tool uh, for creating custom templates and custom fields? Uh, at the moment, um, advanced custom fields, um, simply because of um, how fast I can build things out in the back end. Um, yeah, and I think that the, the interface that it gives the client on the posts and uh, blog posts and pages um, sections is a little bit nicer than that you get in custom Metabox too that I've used on previous projects as well. Okay. Gary? Yep. Uh, okay, so we said you, you obviously like ACF. Um, are there any other kind of key plugins that um, you install pretty much on, on any site to start with? Um, on my desktop server blueprints, I'll bundle in. Uh, I've got ACF and CMB2, so depending on the project, I'll just deactivate one and delete it if I don't need it. Um, I'll normally include gravity forms. Um, as much as I hate the CSS and stuff that comes out of it, I like it as a form solution. Um, if I'm using that, then I'll use um, Carrie Dill's um, Trump plugin just to make things a little bit easier. Um, things I install the Query Monitor plugin that you mentioned by yep. default, and that's extremely useful. And there's another plugin I came across last week, actually, um, WP Basis, I think. Um, it's a plugin that replaces the the default dashboard in WordPress with um, tabs that you can custom you can customize how many tabs and the tab content. So I'm building that out at the moment now, extending it to suit my needs. So I'll be deploying that on client sites as well. Oh, sounds good. Um, you said. A Within your desktop server blueprint, you've got uh, ACF and CMB2, uh, and you said it's kind of dependent on the client. What uh, is the determining factor between, you think, whether CMB2 is more suitable or whether ACF is more suitable for a particular uh, project? I'll take a look at the project, and one thing that differentiates the two is the fact that you have to define your fields with CMB2 through code. Um, if, I want, if I want to complete a project a bit quicker, I find I've got my some ACF presets, and it's easier for me to point and click than it is to write the code. Um, that's simply much simply it at the moment. I think maybe if I if I start experimenting a bit more with the CMB2 plugin, I might three four months down the line turn around and say I prefer using that to ACF. But I think only time will tell that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so as well as uh, starting off with, uh, well, at some point throughout your workflow, uh, there's obviously an instance of desktop server in there. Can you kind of outline what the rest of your uh, workflow is from kind of first getting in contact with a client or getting a lead to following that up to agreeing something, um, I assume getting desktop server kind of instance running locally in there to a, perhaps a staging site and a live site. Can you just outline kind of what your um, kind of methodology is? Um, so if a client gets in touch, I'll before my redesign, um, I usually end up asking him through him or her through an email what exactly do they want if they haven't stated already. And then during the back and forth, we'd agree on things like the budget, um, what exactly do they want doing. Um, during that time, you find out things like if, they, if they've got their branding sorted, they've got the colors, if they've got an overall idea of what they want. Um, if they want to design, then I'll probably jump into uh, pencil and paper while I'm just reading through what they've sent me to give me a brief um, idea, things like that. And then I'll, typically, if it's designed, then I'll jump into Sketch. Now, it used to be Photoshop, um, and mock things up there. If I come up with something, I'll send that to the client, um, get their feedback. Once that's locked in, I'll start developing. Um, normally, 
develop la uh, locally using desktop server. I used to develop with MAMP, um, build something and then push it live to a test server so they can add their content and make sure they're happy and then launch after that then. You said that you moved away from Photoshop to, to Sketch. What was the, the reason for that? Um, I think Photoshop got a bit heavy, a bit bloated for me. Um, it's, it's a great tool for, for photo editing and stuff like that, but the more I started playing with Sketch and experimenting and things like that, I, I, I just came to the realization that it's a great tool for photo editing, but it's not... <laughs> It's not what I want to use to build a design website, so I removed it from from a doc, and I've only got sketch sketch there now. Okay, so I mean, what what sort of percentage would you say you do? <clears throat> sorry, pardon me. Between custom or projects that require custom design and maybe customizing existing templates. Uh, up till about now, I I'd say it's about a fifty fifty split. I'll see most of the work that. I'll get that uh, maintenance work is probably uh, modifying a theme that's already in place, and that that could be something that's custom or something from Theme Forest or something like that. Otherwise, it's uh, typically a custom build starting from starting from scratch with the design. You mentioned Theme Forest. Do you? <clears throat> there are some Genesis developers who only work with the Genesis framework, and there are some who will work with you know a number of themes, including you know, sort of various themes from different places, including Theme Forest. Where, where do you sit on that spectrum? Uh, if I had my own way, I would develop 100% with Genesis. But there are some instances um, where I'm still doing work for people who might have a, a theme that's not Genesis-based, and in some circumstances, I'll turn them away. Um, recently, I had a couple of people come in through um, Odesk and a profile I haven't updated in years regarding thesis work, then I won't touch that anymore. Um, but it depends on the client, depends on the relationship I have with the client, if I'm happy to jump into a theme forest or another pre-made theme. But if I had my own way, it would be 100% Genesis. Do you offer Genesis customization? Uh, sorry, not com uh, customization, conversion. So if somebody came to you and said, I really want to use this theme forest theme, you looked at the code, the code itself was a mess, but you knew that you could essentially convert it for about the same price. I mean, would you offer that type of service? Uh, if they were desperate to include, uh, to, to have something based on the Genesis framework, I would consider it. But uh, again, it depends if they want all the bells and whistles that a theme for this theme that they might like converted over, I would probably would not touch that project. Mm. Okay. Um... <clears throat> So a couple of things there. Um, you mentioned about kind of uh, costing up for the um, for the client potential client. Um, first question: Do you use kind of value-based pricing, or do you hourly, or is it project rate? Um, and what sort of uh, business-related tools uh, do you use for for getting that quote out, um, if anything, for the clients? So I used to do project-based pricing, which is something looking back. I regret so much doing that now. Um, why? Hearing, why do you regret that? Um, after hearing, I think uh, Ben got me onto the idea of value-based pricing, things like that, um, and looking at how I could have possibly charged more by giving the client uh, a better value. I could have probably made more money on some of my past projects. Um, so I'm slowly transitioning to offering, trying to offer value-based pricing for all my projects. Uh, as for tools that I use, um, I used FreshBooks for a while. I'm considering, I had a trial with FreeAgent, and I really like that, so I'm considering switching to that full time. Um, and to manage my projects, I used to use Basecamp, um, but now it's primarily I use Asana. Okay. You mentioned free, work, uh, free Agent, and I <clears throat> will just pipe in there. I cannot thank those guys enough because. For many reasons, my personal or my company's accounts got screwed up going through another, you know, service that we won't name, um, and I had to redo the entire thing. And thanks to its bank reconciliation actually working, unlike this other service who advertised it but didn't actually work, um, I managed to get my accounts done in four hours. You know, so I mean that was like very very quick. But 
you know, <clears throat> it's I think probably as a either as a freelancer or as a small business owner, one thing that I would highly recommend is get the right financial tools because you can get so many things wrong um, and you can end up in a lot of trouble um, if you don't have the right tools. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I suppose that's going back to the, the point about value-based pricing. Um, how, obviously, value-based pricing isn't about raising your prices, but have you seen an increase in the amount that you are making uh, the increased revenue per project um, as a direct result, or are you just winning more contracts um, since using it? I think I'm I'm at, in the process at the moment of switching over. So I think in the past, I'd say six to twelve months, my uh, mentality has I've, I've matured as a developer, as a designer, as a person. Um, I think that's going to help me pr price myself better in the market. But I think work I've done some work for Gary, I've done some work for Joe, and things like that, they've helped me um, rate, slowly raise my rates and give me that confidence to start, to start thinking, yeah, I've got these skills, I've got the experience to do this, I can offer this. So I think value-based pricing, it makes sense for me to adopt that as I go along now. Who is your target audience um, generally, or who you think would be kind of a, a better fit for the value-based pricing uh, model? Um, I definitely, I'd probably go for ideally sm small businesses, so I can probably tell them that uh, if they want to increase their online sales or their online visibility, I could do that with the skills that I can offer. Um, I'm hopefully going to be putting this into practice. A friend of mine starting up as a um, personal trainer, so I'm hoping that's probably going to be one of my next projects. So I'm hoping to use that as a as a test platform in a way to put my my new pricing structure and my new work uh, the workflow that I've got now to and, use. And how are you? Sense at all? So yeah, and, and how are you kind of? Uh, what's your prime primary method of marketing um, to the potential clients? Uh, most of it has been word of mouth, um, but I'm hoping I've got a couple of things coming up. Uh, I'm start trying to do a couple of videos. I'm going to start writing a bit more. Um, hopefully, just trying to get my name out there a bit more, um, so it's not just reliant on one channel of bringing people into me. Okay. Um, one of the the um, the struggles that I think everyone has is trying to make sure that you are <clears throat> not just bringing in leads, but bringing in the right leads. What, what sort of qualification process do you have at the moment? And, you know, how do you sort of sort the, the tire kickers out from the, the ones who are likely to be a, a legitimate, you know, worthwhile project? I recently signed up, uh, there was a discussion in the Slack group about um, WP Elevation. Um, so I've signed up for that, and I'm working through the uh, through the material that was provided there. And just for now, I've got one of the um, example um, project request forms up on my website. Right. Um, so that should hopefully, with the questions that are there, I'm going to be tweaking it as time goes on. But that should um, hopefully give me a better idea of what the client wants to start with, and better determine if they're if they're the right kind of person I want to work with or not. Okay. Um, now, uh, who was it who asked? I think it was Claire. Claire um, asked, how long did it take you to build your own website? Now, I believe that you've recently gone through a, a redesign, so it's quite an appropriate question. <laughs> um, but how long did it take you to build Base93? Uh, the version that's up now, it's been a uh, continuous, um, so I'd say about three or four weeks um, I've been building something and then I'll leave it overnight and then I'll come back the next day and I'll go I don't like the way that that element looks inside inside that box so I'll change it um, but it's been about three or four weeks at the moment and I've used it, it might have been taken a bit longer I've used it as a um, as an opportunity to experiment with uh, new techniques uh, new New practices and things like that. Do you see your website as a, a showcase for what you can do for clients, or do you see it more as <clears throat> a tool that's just straight and narrow? Let's just get something out that will help you capture 
new business? It's a bit of both. If you want to capture, the, I think that if you want to capture the right leads, then you need to show what you're what you're capable of. Um, so it's definitely a place to to get people in touch with me. But at the same time, it's it's definitely a place to show off where I what I can do and what I can offer and what potentially what value I can bring that company down the line. What new techniques? Uh, you, you said you're using new techniques for the sites. Can you explain those? Um, I'm getting my head around something that Harry Roberts is a uh, is a uh, is um is is talking about the block element modifier method. Um, so I'm playing about with that, uh, changing the uh, Genesis grid system. So from what it comes normally, I've been using a tool called GridSet, um, it's a service-based. Uh, it was designed and developed by the guys from formerly from Mark Bolton Design. Um, so that's a good tool. It lets you design your design your grids for your desktop and your, for your desktop, tablet, and mobile and things like that. So I've just taken the time to to, to play with new tools. Um, and yeah, it's something that I've, I can use that now. I know I can implement it inside the Genesis Child theme. I can probably use that then on a client project six, 12 months down the line. So I know I've got the ability to do so. Is, are those tools SaaS based? Uh, grid set. Um, it's a web tool, so you, you sign up for an account, and then it's a point and click. You can build your grid from there then. Um, you can export it. It'll give you normal HTML, CSS, and it'll also give you a SAS file with mixins that you um, use the at include um, function to include the grid that you want to display inside your, inside your style sheet then. And where does the name Base93 come from? Uh, a lot of people ask me. And I honestly can't remember. I was just throwing things together. Um, I let one of my old domains expire, so I was, I was desperately trying to come up with something. And I just randomly came up with that, checked it on Namecheap, it was there, and I'm happy with it, so I've kept it. And the um, the new techniques and the, the grid set and um, kind of the other bits that you just mentioned, is that something that will go towards a starter theme, or have you got an existing starter theme that you use for client work already? Um, I've, in the past couple of weeks, I've been putting everything that I normally do when I start a project off inside the child theme. Um, so I've literally stripped the Genesis style sheet empty, and I've started adding things back in the way I want it to. Um, there are some things in it I wasn't quite happy with. Uh, you'll have a widget declaration at the top of the style sheet, then nothing at the bottom. As another widget declaration at the bottom. So it makes sense to logically group those together. So I've been going through um, things like that. And as a, as a benefit, so for example, with the Genesis navigation, I've split it up into navigation, then you've got primary, secondary, and header. If I'm building a project now that doesn't require the primary navigation or the secondary navigation, because the links are inside the header, I can simply just delete the includes for those two files or comment it out because I don't need it in my framework anymore, so that reduces the amount of code that's actually in my final CSS file. Okay. And, <clears throat> I mean, what, what tools do you use? Uh, so, uh, obviously, we spoke, touched on a couple of tools, but um, which code editor do you primarily use? Is it Sublime or Atom? Yeah, it's Sublime Text, but right. recently, I think yesterday people were talking about Atom in the Slack group, so I've given it a try. Uh, at the moment, it's, it's a pretty nice tool. I might consider switching over to that in the near future. And how much do you use snippets? Because obviously, Shredar re uh, released um, his own Genesis snippets pack uh, the other week. I mean, have you had time to trial that out, or is that do you have your own range of snippets that you use? I've got it installed in Sublime, but I haven't used it yet. Um, I use another tool called Dash, and I've got a lot of Genesis-related snippets inside that. And um, I use a tool I launched on the Mac called Alfred, and it's got Dash integration. So I'll just type Dash space, and then start typing Genesis whatever, and it'll paste the um, desired snippet inside Sublime Text for me. Okay. Um... The, the, um, for, for, I was going to say, just picking up on that, for Dash itself, um, you can also use it as a kind of a code reference um, for, or code reference documentation to, to do that. Um, and I previously generated some documentation for Genesis 2.0, 
and uh, one of the, the community had, had changed that into a dash doc set. So uh, again, I've got dash and I've got Alfred as well, so I can start typing to Alfred uh, on the Mac and uh, just start typing Genesis space, and then I can look up any function uh, just like that without having to open Sublime Text and start looking through the code. Um, so very, very useful. Yeah, a good time saver as well. I'm, I'm pretty impressed with the combination of the two at the moment. I can see how it's going to uh, speed up my workflow, definitely. Yeah, I mean, it's the same. There's, there's a WordPress um, doc set, and there's a PHP doc set, and there's a ton of other doc sets that may or may not be relevant. Um, but those, I completely agree, is, is massive time saver. Um, I think I tried Dash, the, the, the trial or the free version, for a couple of days, and uh, I'd used it so much in those kind of two or three days that um, was it like fifteen pounds, fifteen dollars, fifteen euros, something, something like that. Cheap. And uh, yeah, it's like no, that's. <laughs> That's got to be bought straight away. It's um, just so useful. Mm. I mean, it's a good point that obviously we, we should always be trying to increase our workflow rate and the, the speed that we manage to do our projects in. You said that you took you about three to four weeks for your current website. What would you say is your average cost, uh, turnaround for a, for a customer, for example? Um, I'll normally ask them beforehand for if they've got a, a project time frame, so... If they say we want to launch in two weeks, then I'll say I'll, I'll, I can try, but it depends on you pulling your weights as, as well as I, uh, as I do as well. But it obviously costs more. But um, I think it's at the moment it's, it's hard for me to say or give a definitive answer to that. I think it, it depends on the per project and if they give me the information beforehand. Okay. And something that's becoming more and more common, um, especially if you know you're involved in the the Genesis Slack group, as we are, is accessibility. Now, how how much time have you put into enabling accessibility? Is it something that you look at at the moment? Is it something that you're looking to use in the moment, or um, you know, so sort of where are you with it at the moment? It's something I'm aware of. It's something I think everybody's aware of, but I think it's something that um, isn't done very well by a lot of people. I mean, if you take a look through Dribbble or those, a lot of um, design websites, you'll see stunning designs, stunning concepts, but they'll use white background and neo-white text. Um, I tend to, on my projects now, I'll use the um, Genesis Accessible plugin. Um, there's another one I've started using which um, adds accessibility to to the Gravity Forms things. Gravity Forms WCAG plugin is on the WordPress website. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to common sense. I mean, you're not going to put text that's hard to read over a background. Um, but it's something I'm aware of. It's something I'm trying to keep in mind when I'm designing, when I'm building. Um, and it's something that as on the whole in the community can only get better from now on, especially with people um, handing over so much so much useful information. So in the Slack group, we've got an accessibility channel, and the the amount of useful content that's been generated there it's um, it's unbelievable. Okay. Uh, just uh, as we're about just over halfway through the uh, the show, so if you've got a question for Thomas. Um, then uh, hit us up on Twitter with the UK Genesis hashtag and we'll get your question asked. So, um, one of the, the questions that we always ask people is, if there was one thing that you could change about Genesis, what would it be? Um, at the moment, I find the framework suits me pre pretty well. Um, I'm happy with what it does. I'm happy with what it offers, and I'm I'm happy that with what I can do with it. Um, the thing is, with a, I find with a lot of frameworks, I think coming from thesis, yeah, that had some theme options, but I I'd, I'd rather a theme framework does a group of small things well that I can use than bundle with it a thousand functions that I probably won't even touch, and adds code bloat and makes things. Uh, breaks things further down the line. So at the moment, I have to cop out, but I'm pretty happy with Genesis as it is. <laughs> Maybe um, accessibility features without having to rely on the plugin, having them bundled in the framework, but I'm hoping that 
from what I've read in the accessibility channel that might be coming pretty soon. So I'm I'm pretty happy. Okay. If just uh, as uh, we just mentioned the Slack channel there, if you're interested um, uh, in joining the Slack channel um, or the Slack group and you're not already on there, uh, Sridhar has uh, registered a, a new domain with a, a nice easy link to remember. So uh, if you go to genesis.community slash slack, that will automatically redirect you to uh, an invite, well I think it's a Google Docs form, um, to uh, enter your details uh, and that way we can then invite you to the uh, Slack channel, the Slack group um, and they're in there we've got uh, a dozen, 20, 25 different channels uh, that you can kind of subscribe to, to to choose which aspect of uh, kind of of the community discussions that you want to be involved with. Um, so that's genesis.community slash Slack and that will redirect you to the right form. So uh, this weekend just gone was uh, the WordCamp, uh, sorry, WordCamp London um, event, which I know you weren't able to make your way to, uh, Thomas, but <clears throat> are there any WordCamps that you're looking to attend in the next 12 months? Um, I was thinking about WordCamp Europe, but I probably won't be able, well, won't be able to make that. Um, I'm hoping something might come up, maybe around Manchester. Um, hopefully next year there might be a, a WordCamp Birmingham or something like that like that again. Um, I think it, I'd never been to one up until work on Birmingham, but it's something I definitely want to uh, want to do more of in the future. What and, did you find you got out of that work on Birmingham? Um, I got to meet a lot of people from the Genesis community that um, I was um, previously only talking with through Slack or on, on Google Hangouts. Um, I got to um, learn a lot about Different people's workflows, how they approach certain topics or projects. Um, there was one superb talk during it um, about building a catering website with WordPress and multi-site and advanced advanced custom forms. And there was also some um, the opportunity to network with fellow developers, designers. Um, yeah, I built a couple of relationships up from that then. So overall, it was a pretty good experience. And is is there any? Can we expect to see you speaking at any events in the future, or um, maybe if I can get uh, some decent traction on my blog, um, get some good articles, some good videos up, um, I might consider submitting a, a talk proposal. Um, it's something I'd definitely like to do. Um, give back to the community because I've learned so much. I've taken away so much from it. I'd like to start giving back a bit more now. Are there any meetings, uh, monthly or otherwise, uh, for WordPress that are near you? Not that I'm aware of. Probably the closest would be uh, Manchester. Well, right? Manchester would probably be the closest to me. But a little bit too far just to go for for a night, doesn't look that. But um, if something was a little bit closer, I'd definitely entertain it. Um, it'd be great to have something in Chester or something like that. That would be pretty. That would be pretty amazing. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that there's quite a good community um, of developers in Chester, but unfortunately nothing uh, particularly Genesis-related in, in that area. It's something that, personally, I'm looking at trying to get started either in Liverpool or Chester. But um, I think that that's um, quite a good example of one of the interesting things that came out of WordCamp London. It's quite related to your position that there's a, a shortage of good WordPress developers who know what they're doing. Um, and a lot of the big agencies were admitting over the weekend that they're really struggling and trying to find somebody. Would you ever consider going in-house um, as a full-time um, distributed worker or do you prefer the, the freelance lifestyle? The freelance lifestyle is great. But at the same time, if an agency came up to me tomorrow and said, here's a solid wage packet for you. We've got a job. You, you're guaranteed a job for the next two, three years at least. It'd be a pretty, uh, pretty tempting offer, that one that I would probably accept. Um, being freelance is great. You, you can structure your own day as you, work, as you want. So um, I find that my working patterns, I work well in the morning, don't do that well in the afternoon, but 
sometimes during the evening I work a bit better so I can schedule my day around that. But um, yeah, if if something came up full time or in house and the um, and the wage was good compared to what you could do as a freelancer, what I what the rates I offer at the moment, it's I think we're frozen uh, there. Yeah, unfortunately, um, as you might have guessed, Tomos is in the deepest, darkest depths of North Wales and will occasionally lose signal. So um, while we're waiting for Tomos to uh, regain uh, a decent broadband connection, um, we have got who have we got up on the next uh, show, Gary? On the next show, we've got uh, Angie Vale is a purple baby hippo. Is a fantastic, so, fantastic uh, company name. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, obviously, um, we've got a couple of questions that have come in during the show for Thomas. But um, if there's anything that you can think of that you'd like to ask Angie, um, you know, feel free to drop a tweet at UK Genesis, um, and we will save them ready for uh, next fortnight when we speak to Angie uh, on UK Genesis. Um, so, Gary, what what would you what, obviously one of the big things that came out, and we'll ask a, a more technical question uh, related to Genesis while we wait for Thomas. Um, probably the biggest topic at where Camp London was very much that uh, the REST API. What's your position on it, and you know, so how do you see it impacting Genesis? I don't think. Um... I don't think there's necessarily going to be a whole lot that Genesis Core could do in terms of making use of the the REST API. Um, if there is, I haven't thought of it, um, and I don't think it necessarily needs to try and kind of use the kind of new shiny stuff just because it's there. Um, for, for those who don't know, kind of the REST API is um, basically a way to, like any API, it's a way to communicate and to get data out of WordPress um, and to put data into WordPress uh, without necessarily having to use what we now know as the admin. So for instance, uh, a mobile app could use the, the REST API to, um, to to pull out data and to kind of write new posts um, without using the, the current one that most of them use is the XML RPC um, approach. Um, the REST API, it's... Um, Quite technical, but there is something called RESTful kind of approach to to APIs um, that uses a set of verbs to um, to communicate and so on. But it's, I think, Genesis itself is is not in the position to use it. It already is in WordPress admin, um, and because of that, I think it can just do kind of almost like not direct database calls, but it can use the functions that come with WordPress itself, whereas kind of perhaps some of the, the REST API would be for third-party um, applications, software, um, to connect to particular websites. Where, say, if Genesis is already installed on a website, it's got um, direct access to those WordPress functions uh, and therefore the database already. Fair enough. Right, it looks like we've got Thomas back. Um, I apologize for that. Um, my my machine just froze up, so I had to uh, close out and come back in. I, I apologize for that. Well, one, of the, one of the questions on my list was um, to say, well, I mean, we, we said you're kind of in the deepest, darkest North Wales. Mm. Um, is the presumably you've got a kind of low bandwidth connection there? I mean, on our screen, you're appearing quite kind of pixelated. Um, the low bandwidth is is that a problem at all in terms of um, communicating with clients or kind of just you, you, the work in general? It can be a problem um, with things like this. If I want to hang out with a client or hang out with a group of people, it can, it can be a problem um, like that. Things can be slow, but at the same time, there's a benefit to it because um, my connection can be so slow at some time. I have to design when I, when I'm building a website. I'm trying to get it to load as fast as possible on my slow connection. And if I can get it to load pretty fast on a slow connection, then I'm pretty much guaranteed that if someone's browsing on a connection four times as fast as me, that the website's going to work pretty well for them as well. So yeah, I, I've got to echo that as well. Um, I recently moved from Virgin super fast uh, broadband, which I think was about 50 megabits per second down to uh, about six megabits per second on Sky, and it's definitely opened my eyes um, in terms of sort of how important 
having a, a, a fast loading website can be and making sure that images are optimized because there's nothing worse than seeing an image roll as it loads. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so yeah, I agree with you entirely on that. There, there are benefits to having a slow connection. If for those who have got a fast connection, in uh, some people might not know, within Chrome DevTools, um, there's an option to um, to view the site with uh, kind of a mobile set of tools. So you can use it to to change the user agent string. You can use it to um, change the screen width or the viewport width. Um, and one of the things also on there is to change the connection speed. So you can emulate having a low speed, be it a low kind of 2G or 3G. Um, compared to just your standard desktop, and it will therefore um, it will show you those images um, loading slowly, and uh, so you can get an idea of, of how poor connections would view a website, even if you're still on a fast connection. Welcome to my world. You just do it all, you do it all the time, Thomas. <laughs> so um, Andy had a good question, which was, uh, did you? Learn PHP before you started WordPress, or did your journey into the wonderful world of hooks and filters and other questionable PHP techniques uh, start uh, with gen- uh, with WordPress? Uh, when I first jumped into WordPress, it was strictly um, building out a website to look nice. I wasn't bothered about writing PHP code or anything like that. I just wanted it to be based on WordPress. But as time went on, um, then it, the need became apparent to learn PHP to be able to interact with the server. Um, during my time at university, we was, an emphasis wasn't placed that much on on content management systems or WordPress and like that, but on developing from P, uh, from my course on PHP mainly with PHP. So I had to learn it from there, and it's been a benefit. Thanks jumping into thesis and then jumping into Genesis afterwards, I've got that base then to start working off. So. For example, on the uh, UK Genesis website recently, um, I've been working on uh, the podcast um, airing date, making it update automatically. So if it's displaying before the before the time of the ha- of, of the live podcast, then it shows one message. If it's during the podcast, show another message. And without being able to know PHP, um, things like that, that would have been impossible for me to do. So start with WordPress and then. If you want to do something, read up on PHP website, Google, Stack Overflow, things like that. If you're in the Slack group, jump in there. But it's something that if you want to become a good WordPress developer or a competent WordPress developer, it's something that you're going to have to eventually venture into and learn. One of the more advanced things, um, and it's something I've got on my to-do list to learn for 2015, um, is about kind of automated deployment. Uh, and there's a question from Glenn Dixon. Thank you, Glenn. Um, is asking what kind of deployment workflow or tools do you use? Um, I use Git mainly to back my work up. up to I'm normally using Bitbucket, but as far as um, automated deployment goes, I'm more of a if something's finished and I'm happy with it, I'll push it, push the files via FTP, and then I'll use something like uh, WP Migrate DB then to keep a sync between the live site and my dev site. Um, I'd like to be able to, down the line, just to be able to do something like um, the Beanstalk or Deploy HQ to be able to automatically push my code. But it might be something I end up looking into in the next couple of months. If it shaves off an hour or so of, of my time and makes things a little bit easier for me, then I'm all for learning new things. And I think it's, it's not just the um, potential time saving, especially if kind of you're on a, a slow connection and FTPing is going to be a, a pain mm. in the posterior, then uh, being able to kind of automate it so that you can regularly deploy, even if it's to a staging site, um, mm. and to do it to try and eliminate that um, aspect of human error, saying you're uploading three out of the four files and you're missing an image file, for <laughs> instance. Um, I think being able to, to do that is something is one of the reasons I want to learn it, and uh, it's it's well worth the, t- the investment of time, I think, um, if you've already invested your time in perhaps even more useful things like Git as, as version control. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we're coming into the last 10 minutes of uh, this fortnight's episode. So if you have any more questions for Thomas, uh, do drop them onto <coughs> sorry, Twitter uh, at 
hashtag UK Genesis. Um, what what's the future hold for you, Thomas? Apart from if an agency swings in and gives you an amazing offer. Um, I want to continue to find. I want to work with smaller type businesses. Um, I've found from experience that they might be a bit easy to work with. Um, I'd like to be able to. I've got a couple of videos coming up, um, especially around using SaaS and integrating that with the Genesis framework. And if that goes well, then I'd like to be able to start recording more videos, giving back uh, and helping members of the Genesis and WordPress community. Um, and yeah, hopefully working myself up to possibly being able to be in a position to give a talk at an event if something, if an opportunity does present itself down the line. Okay, so um, we do have a quick fire round. Uh, unfortunately, most of the questions that we had on it have been answered, uh, <laughs> so we, we won't go back through them again. Um, the next one is who who would you obviously we've got Angie on next week, but who would you like to see on the podcast in the near future? Um, I think it'd be interesting to see uh, James on it. Um, I know I met him for the first time in World Camp Birmingham. Um, so I think. He's coming, working for a company at the moment, but thinking of maybe going down the freelance route down in the future. It'd be interesting to hear about about his uh, journey, and possibly is it? Um, hope I'm going to pronounce his name right. Um, Carlo. Um, I'm. He, I met him at the uh, World Camp Birmingham. I think he was in World Camp London with you guys as well. Um, yeah, definitely. It'd be interesting to see because. Um, Believe it or not, James is actually, I'm actually younger than James, but getting some <laughs> younger people in the community. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to get to get their take on things as well. Do you think that age has a, an impact, or are you saying the rest of us are just um, ancient, or <laughs> no, Gary, you just have longer to learn. <laughs> well, that's it. Yeah, age is just a, a number of experience. Yeah. <laughs> PHP I think out spring. Oh, was it? Oh, no, that job didn't quite work as well. PHP string output. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's an interesting thing. I mean, did you? It's actually a good point. Did you learn through any structured education, or did you end up finding yourself, um, you know, sort of teaching yourself? There were. I mean, obviously, you came into the the world of web design and web development through school but I mean did you find any sort of we did you do like an IT course at college did you go to college did you go to university what, you know and so on and so forth um, I say most of the stuff that I've learned and being able to do the things I can do now I attribute 99% of that to doing it myself writing some code watching the screen just turn white to output a thousand errors on me <laughs> fixing the code. Um, when I was at school, um, GCSE um, and A-levels, the focus on IT was mainly just writing reports. Um, so there's nothing really there to, te to teach coding and get kids and people in interested in that. Um, university, I studied a degree in business IT. Um, so the focus in that was primarily business with a little bit of programming. But what what they did teach with, and I think the only programming class I did with PHP was like an intro to PHP, um, and that covered things that I was already confident and knew how to do. Um, so yeah, I'd, I mean, the, there's a benefit of doing programming in university and stuff like that, but for most things, if you're going to be doing WordPress developments and things like that, you're better off installing a copy of WordPress on, on your machine, writing some code, breaking something, and then finding the solution to that. And who knows, maybe six months down the line, you'll see the same problem again, you'll be able to fix it in half the time, the different method. Yeah. And um, there's a lot to be said about teaching yourself versus formal education, I think. Interesting point. How long do you think it, say if somebody was watching this in today or in the future and they were interested in becoming a, a WordPress developer, not necessarily on Genesis, but why they wouldn't use Genesis is beyond me. But <laughs> um, if they were fresh off the boat, let's say, how long do you realistically think it would be before they could, you know, sort of feel comfortable? Is there a certain amount of time? Is it just a case of, you know, 
Are there certain things that they need to get their head around first that will speed up the process? You know, what What would you advise people? I wouldn't consider time a factor because I've been working with WordPress since 2007, I think. So I'm, and I'm still learning. Um, and I think with WordPress having such a low barrier to entry, I mean, ev nearly every web post like HostGate and things like that, you can install WordPress pretty quickly. You can grab a theme from ThemeForest and people can feel comfortable um, building web building websites with, with WordPress. The distinction, I think, comes then being able to build something yourself, not relying on something that's got all the bells and whistles and knowing down the line if that resource was taken away from you and you couldn't use it anymore, could I confidently recreate something that looks like that, that acts like that, that works like that by myself? And if you can't answer yes to any of those three questions, then I think it's then the time you tell yourself, okay, I'm stepping back, I'm going to install WordPress, I'm going to open the, open the single post file and I'm going to look, what does this tag do, what does that tag do? I read the codex, I'll find the support group, uh, join the Slack channel, and then this is how this works, this is how that works. And then you, that's how you start building up. Um, but I would definitely would not say that gives someone the idea that in the year you'll be a good WordPress developer because everybody's got um, different methods of learning and it'll take longer for some people to adjust to coding PHP than it would take someone else. Fair enough. One last question before we start wrapping up. Um, if there was one thing in the WordPress community that you could make disappear, what would it be? Oh, oh um, I was going to say Theme Forest. I was going to say Theme Forest, but I'm going <laughs> to hold myself back because it's, I think it's helped um, increase the popularity of WordPress and get people involved with it. If I had to say ban one thing, it has have to be trolls because... Um, you see people spending so much time on useful open source plugins, they're not getting paid, and then they're getting shot down by someone behind the keyboard who probably doesn't even know how to build half the stuff that they're talking about. Um, it'd be interesting to put them in front of an audience of a like, couple million people and say, go on and you build something, let me tear it to shreds right in front of you. So yeah, be trolls, I think. Fair enough. Okay, so where can people find you online? Uh, on Twitter, <laughs> bring it on. Um, yeah, on Twitter, I'm at Thomas Wynn, and um, you can find me on my portfolio at base93.com. Okay, brilliant. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Thomas. Um, as we mentioned before, uh, in a fortnight's time, we will be interviewing Andrew Wynn of um, Big Purple Hippo. I've, you know, it's such an That's awesome Purple moment. Baby Hippo, Andrew Vale, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, once again, Thomas, thank you very much for, for joining us and obviously, uh, you know, some slight technical issues, but yeah, thanks for persevering. And we will see you all in a fortnight's time. Great. Thanks for having me, yeah, guys. Bye. Okay. Thank you, guys.